Okay, do you have questions? Actually, the lights can go on now. If, if um, oh. yeah. Tom. Yes. Um, right at the beginning of the first lecture, you, you uh, dismissed behaviourism. Um, yeah. What the function, functionalist is saying seems to me a little bit similar. For instance, any state that causes a state of believing that one is in pain is a, is a pain state. Okay. That um, seems to me quite similar to what a behaviourist is Okay, saying. it is very similar. Can I deal with this fairly quickly? Because actually I, I chose not to talk about behaviourism. But behaviourism is the idea that mental states um, are numerically identical to um, behavioural patterns. Um, so you have the input and you have the behavioural output and the behavioural output is the mental state, psychological state. Function that, sorry, that's behaviourism. And then functionalism says that mental states are functional states drawn from a theory, so you get the input, you get the output, and there's the black box inside which you get the mental state. So whereas behaviourism identifies the mental state with the behaviour, the functionalist identifies the mental state with the cause of the behaviour. Quite, quite a serious difference. And whereas the um, behaviourist says that pain is pain behaviour, so it can't account for the actor who displays pain behaviour but isn't in pain. And it can't account for the stoic who is in pain but doesn't, explain, uh, sorry, doesn't display pain behaviour. The functionist can account for both of those because it allows things to go on in here. So um, uh, when Leo uh, is in pain but he believes that his partner thinks that men who show pain behaviour are wimps, and he wants to please his partner, these beliefs act on his, the dispositions to express pain behaviour, to suppress it, so you don't get the pain behaviour out. Now, for a behaviourist, if you don't get the pain behaviour, you haven't got pain. For the functionalist, you can have pain without pain behaviour because you can have interactions within, within the brain. Um, so, do you see that's the difference? Okay. Chris. Uh, yesterday you drew a diagram showing how the science, or causality, was driving reason outside the diagram, if I understood you correctly. I, um, I think I was you, you drew a big circle. Ah. Oh. And you, you, um. had, you said initially it was mostly occupied by reason. Oh, now, I know. Now it's mostly occupied by causality. Yeah. And then you... I mean, it's ages ago. No, I, I know exactly. Um, it was blue. <laughs> it was, yes. This is how I remember where my books are on my shelves as well. Here we go. That exactly one. that. Now, you then went on no. to argue by induction... No, no, the, the eliminativists go on to argue well, by sorry. induction. The arguments it I'm giving argued. are not my arguments. There. It was argued by induction that eventually reason would be driven completely out of that circle. Now, I thought induction was no longer a valid argument. I thought arguing by induction had been discredited. Uh, no, you're, you're taking an argument much further than it could go. There are two sorts of um, arguments. There's inductive argument and there's deductive argument. Deduction gives a certainty and induction gives us only probability. So, for example... Um, if you know uh, Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday, it's Friday, then you will know that Marianne's wearing jeans. Okay. And if Marianne's not wearing jeans, you know that one of those premises is false. Um, that's deduction. You, you always get absolute certainty. With induction, what you get is more or less probability. So every um, day in the history of the world, the sun has risen. Therefore, we think it'll rise again tomorrow. Now, that doesn't give us certainty because the, you could have the, the conclusion could, sorry, the premise could be true and yet the conclusion false. Um, but what you have is inductive weakness or strength. 
So if the sun has risen every day in the history of the world, you've got an inductively strong argument. Every time you've seen Marianne, she's been wearing earrings. That's certainly true of those who've only met me this weekend. Um, so next time you see Marianne using inductive reasoning, she will be wearing earrings. Uh, that's a weak inductive argument, isn't it? Because if you, if you come to my door early in the morning, I probably won't be wearing earrings. Uh, all sorts of reasons I might not be wearing earrings. So the inductive arguments are either strong or weak, whereas deductive arguments are either valid or not. But I would want to argue on the diagram that you put up there. That, 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 that line, I agree, is driven across to the right. I think there will come a point when it will stop. I don't think you can well, argue that it will drive reason. OK, if you disagree with the eliminativists, you need to find reason why. Um, the eliminativists say, uh, and actually it's a pretty strong inductive argument, that there was a time when we used reason explanation for virtually everything, now we use it for very little. Uh, the eliminativists say, actually this will continue, science will continue to find causal explanations until reason explanations are no longer needed. You disagree with that, you need to find why do you think that science will never explain the mind? Now, I've given you perhaps one reason for thinking that, um, but lots of people would reject externalism. <coughs> Eleanor. Um, Eleanor, is that right? Yes, that's right. In, in that argument, I would say I don't accept either of your explanations <coughs> for the simple reason that you assume a closed system. If it is a closed system, at a certain point, we will find the end of it. But if we think of knowledge as an open system, always expanding, and we have never seen... Uh, no, uh, Eleanor, actually that's not true, because um, what the eliminativist is saying is that science uh, one day will explain everything. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean it will explain every token thing. Um, it means it'll explain every type of th uh, thing. So, now this is where I need to... Um, so, if science is right, sorry, if eliminativists is right, um, I, okay, the biggest problem for eliminativists is... Um, Here's a, a type of thing, and here a whole lot. OK, this is an instance of understanding. And this is another instance of understanding. OK? Now, if science is going to explain everything in, physical, in terms of physicalism, neural states, etc., then science will need to explain that. And it'll need to explain that, etc. Now, every time it explains it, there'll be another of these that is not explained. Do you see what I mean? Science is open-ended. It will never explain everything because it explains that, but immediately that's unexplained. That's but if you can explain this type of thing, then, then that's only in practice unexplained, not in principle unexplained. And science, if it in principle can explain all these things, that isn't a problem for you science. You already put a boundary around it. Mm -hmm. uh, but but that's that's no, no, but that's the point. That's the point. You always restrict. It's not, it's not you, it's the science. Put no, no, boundary. because... Well, OK, take away my boundary. Look, do it like this. Ah! No boundary. I'm, I'm sorry, the paper is a boundary, but it needn't be, because here are lots of different tokens of understanding. And actually, we could fill this room. We could fill the world. We could fill the universe with different tokens of understanding. And if science can explain understanding as a type of phenomena, then although there'll always be tokens that science hasn't actually explained, which is the open-endedness of it, it could still explain the type, and therefore there's no principled problem for scientism. Uh, I disagree. OK. But you need to come back on my argument. Maybe you will in a minute, but, but let's let someone else... Um, you, then you, then you. You'll have to remember that. I just want to pursue just a little bit about the point I tried to make before, which some of these thought experiments have felt very uncomfortable. Fe felt, very felt very uncomfortable. Yeah, I agree. And um, I think 
that there's something illegitimate about combining the language of an ordinary experiment, which can give us some sort of provisional description of the world, about which we can never be certain, with a statement about absolute truth that we could only really know analytically. And I, I don't think it's legitimate to combine those two. So can I show you why we cannot not combine those two? I've done it already, but let's do it again. Um, um, as a scientist, and indeed as philosophers, um, how do we determine the truth value of that is water? Any observation statement, which as a scientist you're wanting to determine the truth value of all the time, that's what scientists do. They have theories that generate observation statements and what they need to do is test whether those observation statements are true or not. There are two types of knowledge that go into the testing of... En no, let me finish. You've, uh, you've asked a question and I'm... It's a terribly important point because you're saying whether they're true or not, but that's the whole point about science. It can't decide that. Uh, um, it is simply a description of the world which is improved all the time. We, we can't decide what is true and what isn't in that sense. OK, um, you will at least accept it tries to decide operational truth. Uh, maybe not absolute truth, but operational truth. So if, for example, here we have a statement, neutrinos can travel faster than light. OK, there's a statement. Those people in CERN think that this is either true or, or change your, my word true for your word, whatever you prefer. But what we're interested in is whether neutrinos can travel faster than light. If they can, this explodes the theory of general relativity. How interesting, how fascinating. Could string theory be true after all? Um, if neutrinos can't travel faster than light, um, and you see that actually the word truth or some synonym of truth is going to come in here whatever you say. What we're interested in is whether neutrinos travel faster than light. And what I suggest we mean by that is whether the statement neutrinos travel faster than light is true or not. And it's an observation statement. I agree that by observation we're not talking about our senses, um, but we are talking about things that we can conduct empirical experiments at huge expense on. So any observation statement you like, that is water, or neutrinos travel faster than light, there are two things that go into it. One is, what does the statement mean? What is a neutrino? I mean, actually, if we don't understand what a neutrino is, if any minute now we discover that actually there are some neutrinos that travel faster than light, but others that don't, well... OK, is that because there's a difference between the initial conditions where we set off these neutrinos to travel fast than light? Or is it a difference in the neutrinos it itself? In which case, is neutrino a word that means neutrino or neutrino or something? Do you see what I mean? You have to understand the meaning of the sentence and you have to conduct experiments in the, in the case of neutrinos, empirical experiments to determine whether the truth value, the truth conditions in a context are satisfied. So philosophy comes into everything a scientist does because the scientist has to assume a meaning in order to determine a truth value. That's why I believe that you can mix philosophy and science. Um, in fact, you have to. And the scientists who think they don't are scientists who are assuming that they do know the meaning of what they're doing, which most of the time is fine. Um, but when they hit a problem, they might ask, them, sorry, Eleanor, I know you want to speak, but so do other people. It's fine. A philosophical statement, to be true, has to be internally consistent. But it, and it doesn't need... What do you mean by... What's um, means that one statement is balanced equally truthfully, rationally, against another. But it doesn't need an external um, aspect to, to make it true or false, does it? Well, that is water is only going to be true if... When I point to that and I say that is water, 
Um, what makes it my belief, I'm pointing inside my head, which of course maybe I shouldn't be, but let's do it for the time being. My what makes my belief true is that's being water. That's, a, that's not a philosophical statement. It's a, it's a scientific one, isn't it? Uh, it's an observation statement, yes, but I, I've said that any observation statement, you can determine the truth only by determining philosophically what its meaning is and then empirically what its truth yeah. value is. So the idea that that isn't a philosophical statement, well, OK, true, it's a scientific statement, um, but there are still philosophical questions to ask about it, and, and indeed about any, because meaning is a philosophical problem. Well, a philosophical issue, I should say. If externalism is true and wholly true... I'm sorry, I did say I'd come to you. I will in a minute. <laughs> if externalism is true and true all the time then we would not be able to make counterfactual statements, surely, or draw other than realist pictures. Uh, I mean, we couldn't draw sort of surrealist pictures. And therefore, there must be some kind of internal state and process. OK, I disagree with you, and I think you're confusing truth conditions and truth value. Let me show you why I think this, and may, if, you, if you think I'm wrong... So here's a counterfactual. A counterfactual is a conditional statement, the antecedent to which is false. So um, if, if Marianne, uh, no, let's say, if it is Friday, Marianne is wearing <coughs> jeans, because we all know that Marianne always wears jeans on a Friday. This is a counterfactual statement because it isn't Friday, is it? The antecedent here is false. Okay. How do we determine the truth value of this statement? Well, what do, what do we have to do to determine the truth value? Make some observations. Um, well, <coughs> if on Friday you discover I am wearing jeans, does that tell you that if it's Friday, Marianne will be wearing... I mean, you need a bit more than that, actually. Um, you need to look at the possible world in... What, oh, sorry, you need to survey possible worlds to see if you can find a Friday where Marianne isn't wearing jeans. And if you can't, then that's true. Um, so it's... Ex um, sorry. Um, what, there's no... It's exactly the same thing. You, there are two questions to ask. One is, what does this mean? And the other is, is it true? And in this case, as this isn't an empirical question, uh, because it's involving counterfactuals, in order to determine it's true, you've got to survey possible worlds. But actually, if you think Marianne means me here, but actually it means someone else, so, so the me you've got the meaning wrong. When you survey the possible world, you'll be taking the wrong person through. Do you, do you see what I mean? And you might get the wrong answer to that question, not because you've got that wrong, but because you've got that wrong. So, so it's, it's completely um, general. A any, if you're looking at language and... Uh, the truth of sentences in that language, you've always got two things to look at. And sometimes it involves looking at possible worlds as well as this world. Or sometimes it looks, involves looking at possible situations in this world as well as actual ones, if you don't like possible worlds talk. John, I'm sorry, I did say I'd come to you. Um, a lot of philosophers who you've talked about here seem to imply that mental states can't affect the physical worlds. Many of the theories we've looked at yes. make it difficult to say that they do, yeah. I'm quite convinced that they do. I can think of many examples in my own experience. We all can. Do. Well, but I think one externalism allows a way around this, because if my mental states originate outside of my mind and then go on to affect things in the external world, then the causal problems seem to be largely resolved. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. We're not saying that mental states are outside the head. We're just saying they're not inside the head. Even if you're an internalist, you might think that mental states have origins outside the head. But the, in, the externalist doesn't say that beliefs are, are outside the head. 
it says that they're not inside the head. And there's a big difference between saying something's not inside and saying it's outside. Actually, externalists believes that mental states aren't located in space <coughs> at all. Um, physical objects are located in space. They have to be, um, because that, that's of the essence of being a physical object. But, but if, you're, if you believe that mental states are not internal states, you can actually say they're not located at all. Ugh, forest of hands. I think you were next. Um, well, mine's also about externalism, and I think in a, in a way it's... A I think of quite things. a few of them are probably about externalism. I thought that you said about externalism that, you know, I could not have a belief about Marianne unless Marianne existed. The externalist could believe that, yeah. So where does that leave imagination? Where I can imagine something which doesn't exist? Yeah, uh, that's fine. Um, here's Penny, um, and here's Penny again on a different occasion, let's say. Uh, here's Marianne. I'm thinking about this as I go along. <laughs> okay, here. <laughs> Actually, Penny, this is your head, <laughs> whereas this is the whole of me. <laughs> OK, um, in this case, Penny is having a thought about Marianne. OK, so I'm assuming at the moment, you, I mean, now you've met me, you can go away and have a th thought. You don't actually have to have met me. There are, there are people who have never met me um, who, who can have thoughts about me. Um, and that's, that's fine externally. Now, here's Penny using her imagination uh, to think about a, a woman. She's five foot six. She's got... Um, short hair, she's wearing a purple jumper. I mean, actually, it's amazing. If you could look inside Penny's head, you would think, oh, Penny's talking about Marianne. Penny's thinking about Marianne. But actually, Penny has never come into causal contact with me at all. That's why it's I easier to say I don't exist at all. Um, but if you've never come in, so you've never come into causal contact with anyone who's met me or heard about me or... Um, so take someone in, where were we? Outer Mongolia before. There will be somebody sitting in Outer Mongolia, believe it or not, who has never heard of me and never come into causal contact with me and never come into causal contact with anyone who has heard of me. Could that person think about me? Yeah. They, they could imagine something that by coincidence is, is phenomenologically indistinguishable for me. She's even got this you know, very irritating English voice and, and with same inflection and same certainty. And, you know, there is nothing. You couldn't put a card between what this person is imagining and me. But is it me? Many people would say no, couldn't be. But how could that, so that I, how could that idea have come from the external world, then, which I thought was what externalism was? Well, the fact is you've met people who are five foot six before, you've met women before, you've met people wearing purple jumpers before, you've met, you, and you put all these things together so in your imagination. imagination. A, a, you know, a completely bizarre alien creature. I'm sorry, I don't know where you're going with that. Where did that come from? Well, you couldn't imagine something... I mean, all you can do is take the concepts that you have, <coughs> split them apart from each other, and put them back together in creative ways. So, so um, that's what it is to think. I mean, OK, you're all thinking of elephants now. I see you. You're all thinking of elephants, but there isn't an elephant within 100 miles of this place. I mean, the thing is, you are not restrained in your thoughts to things that are perceptually present. Arguably, arguably, we're the only animals that can do that. Um, and the reason we can do it is, is one of the reasons that we can imagine things. I mean, imagine that I'm wearing yellow, the same colour that David's wearing. OK, you're all able to imagine that now because you're able to take the yellow that you know from there and what I'm wearing that you know from here and swap them around a bit in your imagination. You can do that because you have concepts, and that's what a concept is. Um, it enables you to think creatively. But what you can't do is come up with something completely from new. You're always putting together. I mean, you won't come up with a colour that um, nobody else... Sorry, that's probably wrong. Um, 
you won't come up with a colour that you haven't ever experienced. Or at least, I'm sorry, I can see cans of worms <laughs> opening up there. Uh, we, only, uh, we only create those imaginations that are already in the heart before. Like, we see them, we observe them somewhere, then we can put creation, make them we some put them together. Yeah, the thing we never seen, we cannot create anything without, like, the basic building blocks. Yeah. yeah. There is something always, always present in, in our head before. That's why we create something <coughs> new from those other things to mix up. So, so we've got the ingredients there. We pull them apart and we put them together again in, in different ways. That's what it is to think. That's what it is to exercise imagination. If, if we couldn't do that, we couldn't ever come up with new ideas. Look, there's the moon. How do we get there? Um, you know, and we put together different concepts and we come up with a new sort of action. Um, John, I, I can't, just can't keep up. So. I think you probably answered my part. I was going to ask you how Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, but you're saying that he took mm. existing things and just broke them up. Yep. Uh, okay. Um, somebody who hasn't, David, you haven't. Uh, sorry, I, okay, I see you, but David's first and then you. To be, uh, to, to hold an externalist view, does that mean you cannot hold an epiphenomenalist view or an eliminatist view? To hold an externalist view, you wouldn't hold, externalists are realists about the mental, eliminativists are not realists about the mental, they think the mental doesn't exist at all. And externalism is a theory about mental states. So you couldn't be both an eliminativist and an externalist. Could you be an epiphenomenalist and an externalist? Um, probably. Yes, I, I don't see why not. Um, I'd have to think about the implications of that, but, uh, but I don't immediately see why not. Um, John. Could externalism conceivably rescue... Uh, Cartesian substance dualism <coughs> from extinction for many years before and after. That. Sorry, could externalism? Externalism. Could it, could it, uh, it, could it re, uh, uh, rehabit it? Revivify. Uh, the substance dualism. But for, but for many years before and after Descartes, people believed in things called soul or spirit. Is it possible that externalism could revive this? Um. I think that's unlikely. Um, the reason I think it's unlikely is because I think both that functionalism and anomalous monism can both <coughs> account for externalism. So if, um, now I haven't got my pretty pictures, but imagine the externalist picture, okay, with a pink round the whole of the outside. Um, you can believe that everything in that picture is physical but the, the whole of it is mental. Do you, do you see what I mean? So the only ingredients that go in... I can't think about you unless I've met you, but you're physical, and so am I, and, and the causal interactions between us have all been based on physical interactions. So um, my ability to think about you is something that's emerged from the physical relations between us. So, so I think it's unlikely that externalism will... I actually don't see how you could revivify a, a substance dualism. I, I, I don't know of any substance dualists. But religion, religious beliefs go on, even among some philosophers. Well, but religious beliefs are completely... You don't have to be a, a substance dualist to have religious beliefs. I, I, I have religious beliefs, but I don't have... I'm not a dualist. Or at least I'm not a substance dualist. I mean, you, you, lots of scientists who are certainly not dualists have religious beliefs. Can you be an externalist and have religious beliefs? Why not? Well, uh, because I could argue that you, that you can't have experienced God. Um, I've never experienced uh, various other things about which I have beliefs. <laughs> well, no. Uh, when you see atoms in bubble chambers, uh, you um, don't. Um, the fact that you see the the track in the in the cloud chamber, um, rather than the atom itself, uh, you might still describe your observation as having seen an atom. 
because what you see is what you take to be the effects of the atom. What do I think are the effects of God? This! <laughs> you know, I see God in everything. Um, you don't believe in the soul, though, do you? We're not going to get into my religious <laughs> <laughs> beliefs here. Um, I've forgotten where I am. Can I, uh, Bill, would you mind sharing this? Write down the names of people or descriptions of them. We won't show anyone afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because I'm just getting completely lost and I don't want to be... Un Who hasn't asked a question and would like to ask one? Okay. Um, well, well, That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> one of the theories of mine you haven't discussed this weekend is panpsychism. I uh, wondered if you'd like to say why you don't consider it worthy of consideration. Because I don't know anything about it, actually. <laughs> but it's, I mean, Whitehead held it, I think, charm of Maybe they did, but I still don't know anything about it. Um, uh, tell me what it is. Panpsychism is the theory where um, matter uh, all is, is all matter. It, matter is not inanimate. That all matter has some degree of mental quality. Okay. Well, do you remember I talked about um, idealism? Somebody was asking me about idealism. Mary, it was you, wasn't it? Um, idealism is not the same as panpsychism, um, but it has. It sounds as if it has things similar. The idealist believes that everything is mental. Whereas the physical list believes everything is physical, and if mental states exist, they are some combination of physical things. The mental, the, the idealist believes that everything is mental, and the physical is some combination of mental things. Um, so I haven't discussed idealism or panpsychism, but actually I have quite a lot of sympathy for idealism, um, but that's another lecture. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not putting on one side the possibility that everything is... Sorry, I am putting on one side, but I'm not rejecting the idea that everything is mental rather than everything is physical. Frank. <laughs> epiphenomenalism. <laughs> You've mentioned one problem uh, for epiphenomenalism is uh, adaptiveness insofar as uh, thoughts wouldn't have uh, evolved or thinking uh, if they had no causal... Um, effect, efficacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least as great a problem, I would have thought, was the fact that we can describe our thoughts, uh, we can be prompted to do things by thoughts, and most of all, in the Mary's room, Mary, when she saw red <coughs> when she came out of the room, said, wow, so that's red. Now, how could that happen if she hadn't been caused by her mental state. Okay, I discussed this very problem. Can anyone remember what the response was I gave to it? So the objection to epiphenomenalism is, well, hang on, mental states cause behaviours. Mary said what she said because she experienced red. Therefore, how can you say that mental states are not causally efficacious? What was the answer? I'll find it. Just to prove I did talk about it. It was blue again. The common cause for the original cause causes both the Well done. Exactly so. Um, if we go back, the answer is... Um, yes. Here we are. So, um, this is Mary's experience of red. This is her... Ooh! Goodness, look at that. Um, this is the state that causes both of them. Um, so there's a correlation between these two, uh, or a coincidence, we'd say, as it's a one-off thing, a coincidence between these two, but that's because both of them are caused by this, not because this causes this. That was an easy one. Could I ask if in... David. Uh, philosophical nomenclature um, that knowledge is time dependent or does it have to be not because you say it has to be true for all time can knowledge be provisional really? Oh, of course uh, okay so, so I don't uh, there are bits of knowledge I don't know quite what you mean by time dependent, but let's... Well, let's what, I, um, what I really mean is, if, say, a lecturer talking to a group of students says, I'm telling you this now, but I don't know in ten years' time half of this will be untrue, 
but this is what I think now. Okay. Is all of what he is saying knowledge, or is half of what he is saying not knowledge? I'm thinking, and you know, on something like this neutrino thing, a year ago, nothing travelled faster than light. So okay. was that knowledge, or...? No. Uh, well, uh, n put it this way. Um, so we, we have a belief, and we've had this belief for, for since 1905, is that, is that right? Um, that nothing travels faster than light. Um, now, uh, this is knowledge, or at least a necessary condition for this being knowledge, is firstly, uh, it's a belief. So you can't know that neutrinos, uh, sorry, that nothing travels faster than light unless you believe nothing travels faster than light. Second thing is you must be justified in believing it. Uh, it is justified. So your belief can't count as knowledge unless you have a justification for it. Um, thirdly, it's got to be true. Now, um, because it, if it's not true, it's not knowledge. You may believe that it's knowledge, Okay, you may believe that it's true, but it still not be true. I mean, as a matter of fact, you can't have a belief that P without believing that P is true. But you may be wrong about your own belief in your belief that your belief is true. So that knowledge then can't be provisional? It has no, no, knowledge is always provisional. N knowledge depends upon truth. And as we can never get to the truth independently of our beliefs, our justifications, knowledge is always provisional. So if now it's untrue, it's not knowledge, but it was knowledge? No, we believed it was knowledge, or, or actually very few scientists would claim it was knowledge because scientists are so frazzled by Popper that, that, that they um, never claim to know anything these days, but they really think they do know. But this, this has really upset them, because if they thought they knew anything, they really thought they knew this. And like um, as you know what happens in all possible worlds. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly so. Uh, no, both philosophers and scientists, doesn't matter who they are, knowledge is always provisional, because knowledge depends upon truth, and truth is metaphysics, not epistemology. So the, uh, the best we can say is that we're justified in believing this, and our justifications will always be um, other beliefs which are rationally related to whatever the belief is. But until we can show that it's true, we can't claim that we know that it's knowledge. So let's, let's go back to the one I keep doing. And, and this is a thing that really I can't tell you how important it is. Uh, David, I get really irritated when pens don't work. Yeah, I don't like red. Well, I do like red, but it tends not to come over as well as black. So let's try it. Can you see it? Okay, David believes... Uh, he, David, knows nothing travels faster than light. Okay? There's an embedding sentence. David believes he knows that nothing travels faster than light. And there's an embedded sentence. David knows that nothing travels faster than light. Now, the embedding sentence might be true... David believes he knows that nothing travels faster than light, whilst the embedded sentence is false. He believes he knows it, but he doesn't know it because it isn't true. Or for whatever other reason. Um, do you see? You, whatever, whenever you think that you can't... I mean, for example, let's, let's have a look at... Um, David believes he remembers something. Uh, he remembers P. Um, well, he might believe he remembers it, but if P didn't happen, he doesn't remember it. So his belief that he remembers it is false. So you can believe that you know something and yet be wrong. You can believe that you remember something and yet be wrong. 
And, and the reason you would be wrong is because to remember something, it must have happened. In the same way, to know something, it must be true. These are factive states. So you don't like the false memory? Uh, no, I, I think false memory is badly named. If, if, you re if you remember it, it must have happened. What false memory is, is the belief that you remember it, where the belief that you remember it is false, because if it didn't happen, you don't remember it. But you may believe that you remember it. In fact, I assume that's what's happening in false memory, is somebody falsely believes that they remember that something happened when it didn't. That's what false memory is. It's on the definition of remember. Yeah, because rem you can't remember P unless P happened. Same way you can't perceive P unless P exists. So when Macbeth said, is this a dagger before me? Uh, the answer is no. <laughs> it, it may be with you as if there's a dagger in front of you. Obviously it is. So Macbeth believed there was a dagger in front of him. Was there a dagger in front of him? No. So perception <laughs> is factive. You don't perceive a dagger unless there's a dagger there. You don't remember stagging, stabbing Malcolm unless you stabbed Malcolm. You may falsely believe that you remember, was it Malcolm? King of the Scots? Duncan, Duncan thank you. I th I th Malcolm's the son. The belief is true, isn't it? The, the, original, the, belief, is the, belief, the original thing that kicks I love a chance to do it again. The, the thing that kicks it all off. I'm sorry, the thing that kicks it all off. I see that the embedded thing. Macbeth believes he sees a dagger. Okay? That's true. Does Macbeth, Macbeth perceive a dagger? No. That's fine. But the, Macbeth believes, what he believes is... That's true. The embedding sentence is... Oh, yeah. The embedding sentence is true. But, but the sentence embedded is false. So Macbeth has a... It's true that Macbeth has this belief. The belief that Macbeth has is false. Shall I do that again? No, no, no. I've got it. But, uh, it just seems very sort of relativist somehow. Um, because you, you can keep going back to something that eventually you can say is true. Um, I, I honestly don't know what to say about that. There is nothing relativist about what I've been saying here. What, what I'm doing is I'm pointing out the logic of um, the fact that there's a difference between the world that we picture and our picture of that world. And we we tend to think only of the world that we picture. That's what we're conscious of. We're conscious of this table, not our beliefs about this table. Do you remember what I said yesterday about we become conscious of our belief when something goes wrong? So when I put my glass down on the table and it crashes to the floor, I realise that my belief the table was there was false. Um, but when it's not false, when I put it down and therefore don't even think about the table, doesn't mean my belief wasn't there just means it was true. And as long as our beliefs are true, we don't notice them at all. But they're always there. If I say, I believe that ducks are mammals, it's very easy to say, you're wrong. No, uh, not wrong. I do believe that ducks are mammals, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yes, what, you, what you're wrong about is ducks being mammals, yes. In the uh, Rutledge Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I recall that being uh, recommended, um, it starts off in the entry of philosophy of mind. Philosophy of mind and philosophy of psychology are two terms for the same general area of the philosophical inquiry. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested, following through, I asked you this yesterday at dinner, about the ongoing interface between philosophers uh, of mind and uh, people in the world of psychology? Well, um, some philosophers are very purely philosophers. They're not terribly interested in what psychologists do. Some psychologists are very interested in psychology. They're not particularly interested in what philosophers do. And then there's a continuum coming right up to the middle where you get philosophers and psychologists who are working together on things, and, and there's the whole spectrum 
um, because <coughs> when, whenever you get I mean, philosophy of physics is exactly the same thing. You get philosophers of physics who are not interested in physics, not, not many of them, <laughs> but, but you do. And there are physicists who are not at all interested in philosophy of physics. And then there are ones in the middle who are very interested in both and work together quite closely and everything in between. So, so philosophy of maths is the same, philosophy of religion. Um, and just following on from that, that's one of the things psychologists are interested in is um, aberration or madness or, you know, or passion. So that, malfunction. Um, malfunction, yeah. yeah. So that uh, most of us here are, have only been hearing your voice, um, but there may be some people in the room who are hearing St. Michael and uh, St. Peter and uh, Angel talking also at the same time, right? Uh, now, we would say that's because they're schizophrenic or they have a dysfunction. And I wondered whether how philosophers deal with um, this sort of... Average. I don't know, um, because I, I'm not that sort of philosopher of mind. I, I'm interested in what the mind is. Um, I'm less interested in, in the malfunction of the mind that we call schizophrenia, if we still... We, uh, we stopped calling it schizophrenia, didn't we? But, uh, but anyway, um, I, I'm not particularly interested in that, so I don't know. But there are philosophers who are very interested in that, I can think of one right now, um, and, and he would be able to answer that in a way I can't. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's your next. Yeah. No, not yeah. yeah, I think I've got a simple, simple one. A um, simple one? I hope so. I'm a bit uncomfortable about the split between internalism and externalism. Mm. Could you be an externalist with elements of internalism? Um, if I understand you correctly, and I might not, Every externalist has elements of internalism because you can't be in a state unless you have a state inside you. So do you remember the externalist pictures I had up here? Um, in each case, inside the head, there was something going on. No externalist would think that um, somebody could have a belief unless there's something going on in here. The only thing they're denying is that what's going on in here is the belief. But are they not saying externalists that it all starts outside? No, there's no start about it. We're, we're looking at the, the idea of a state, the, the state of believing P. Um, the state of believing P, or the, okay, the state of my believing that John's wearing grey rather than red, um, is a state that um, I, if I didn't have anything going on, my, on in my head, I couldn't have that belief. But nor could I have that belief unless John exists. So two necessary conditions, neither of them sufficient for belief, are what's going on in my head and my relation with John. So externalism doesn't deny that there's things going on in the head. It only denies that it's the things going on in the head that are the belief. Okay. Okay, I've got that distinction. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if, you, if later on you look at them, actually you've had all your handouts done in black and white, haven't you? <coughs> Sorry, that's my fault. Yeah. And you won't be able to see my pretty pink. But you will be able to see the circle and the, the pink all round the outside, which is externalism, <coughs> and the pink with the circle. But if you look at the externalist one, there is something going on inside the head. We don't have beliefs unless we have things going on inside the head. Nobody would you deny that. So many more PowerPoints. Um, if you're members of the PhilSoc, you can get those by going online to the PhilSoc and requesting them, and they'll get sent to you by email. This is called blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Harold. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, consciousness, in my opinion, has a genuine role in behaviour. It's not just an. Most of us believe that mental states have a genuine role in right, that's part of my question. Secondly, I believe the physical world is causally closed. Now, I haven't yet been able to marry up these two beliefs, but I, I do think some synthesis could be possible. So what I want to ask you, you've answered partly already, whether you shared those beliefs, and if so, could you give some indication about how you personally, oh. you personally attempt to combine them? Right, okay, so the first belief was mental states are causally efficacious. I mean, you, you said consciousness, but I'm just going to put mental states, and I can't spell efficacious, but don't worry, you can. Uh, and you think that physics is causally closed 
In other words, any event that interacts with a physical event is itself a physical event. Okay, so you believe both those things and you want to know how is this possible. Okay, and you're asking me yeah. what I believe. Okay, um, I'm not going to tell you what I believe. Um, the answer is I'm not sure, actually. I suspect that this is false, um, actually, but, but I, I, don't, I certainly don't know that, even by David's <laughs> standards. Uh, in other words, I don't even believe I know that. I, I'm open on that. Um, I find it very difficult to deny that. But, but actually, unless you're an epiphenomenalist, you would find it very difficult. And the reason we're not ep epiphenomenalists, if we're not, is because we believe that. Um, most physicists would believe that. Most of us in this room probably believe this. Um, how is this possible? Well, <laughs> this is what, exactly what we're asking. We, we want to know the answer to this question. And what I'm saying is, if you're an identity theorist, it's dead easy because mental states are physical states, and therefore the fact that physics is causally closed is not a problem. This is entirely consistent with this. So identity theory is one possibility. Another possibility, functionalism, says that mental states are physical states. They're functional states, but the functional is, is always paid by a physical state. So that's not a problem. Um, so functionalism can answer that but it's a very different answer. Anomalous monism, the objection is it can't answer that, but the anomalous monism will come back and say, actually, that's because you've got the wrong theory of causation. Um, so anomalous monism claims to be able to answer that. Does it? We've been looking at that this week. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's what we've spent the whole weekend, if you like, looking at. We, we, we want to believe that. We really want to believe that. Mostly we do believe this. That gives us this problem. What's the answer to this problem? Take your pick. <laughs> but you would not pick, I assume, since you've said nothing about them, anything to do with uh, complexity theory, chaos, quantum mechanics. Well, because I don't think any of those theories can answer this question. No, the only, the only theories that can answer this question are philosophical theories like the ones we've been through. The, this, is, this is a philosophical question. It's not a, a scientific question. It's not an empirical question. But many problems have been called not scientific and later proved to be so. Um, it, if um, the eliminativists are right, and there aren't any mental states, never mind, if they're not any mental states, then they're not causally efficacious. So this is false, and science will have shown us that this is false. I'm not denying that sci science could easily, uh, no, I take that back. Science could show us um, that this isn't possible by showing that there are no mental states, or by science showing us that mental states are not causally efficacious, or indeed that physics is not causally closed. Um, so science could answer this question for us, but if it does, it would do it in a very different way. Um, I, I suspect it would do it by showing that mental states are not, don't exist. I, I think eliminativism might be the way science would answer this question. And of course, actually, it answers this question by saying that's false rather than by showing that these two are consistent. John? As externalism brings part of the sort of thought outside these individuals, I'm wondering if any of them have made a huge <coughs> leap to say that that has any implications for life after death. So can you, you know, remove the individual from it and continue without the body? Well, um, somebody, I can't remember who it was. It was John, I think asked me if uh, externalism could make um, Cartesian souls and Cartesian dualism respectable again. And I said, I thought not. Um, I, I don't see why externalism would have anything to say about life after death either. Um, because if you think that everything external to your body is physical in the way that everything external, sorry, internal to my body 
is, is physical. Um, I can continue believing that as an externalist. Um, and I could, in addition, believe that there's life after death, but my belief in life after death wouldn't necessarily come from my belief. I'm not, not entirely sure why it would have to... In fact, I don't think it would have to come from my belief that <coughs> mental states are external states. But, so without a body, they could still believe in life after death? So thought continuing without the body? Well, no, because I've said that internal, externalists believe that without something going on inside the head, you don't have a belief, so I assume if you don't... But you were saying that they could believe then, it, it wouldn't prevent them from being, believing in life after death or not after death. I thought you said just that. I, may have I do. Well, I could be in a... I could believe both... Um, mental state... Uh, let's just get rid of it. <laughs> mental states are external states, there is life after death. I see where you're going. Um, so what you're saying is, uh, after death I wouldn't have a body, uh, and therefore there wouldn't be a... Okay, um, yes, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe I couldn't be an... Ex or if I were an externalist and I believed that, I would have to deny that external states involved... Neural states, perhaps. Yeah, OK. I, I can see where you're coming from on that one. I'm, uh, if you're asking me whether I agree, I'd like to think more about it. I... I beliefs are beliefs until proven true. Sorry, Sorry, say this again. Beliefs are beliefs until the proven true. Like in the case of light, it was like uh, <coughs> nothing travel faster than light. In first case, it's a belief. And second, it's justified. And the third, it's true. Yeah. So the belief are belief until proven true. So I have a question that uh, there are two terms used. I often read them like hypnotism and telepathy. They are considered able to be a mental state. So hypnotism. Hypnotism and telepathy. Um, so if we change um, nothing travels faster than light to Nassim, did you say? Yeah. Spelt thus? A-S-A-M, okay. No, it's just A-S-I-M. Can you pretend that I've spelt your name correctly? <laughs> um, believes... Uh, no, actually, let's change that. Let's just say hypnotism works. And telepathy as well. How do you spell hypnotism? I've really... My H -I -N Okay, hypnotism works. And telepathy. And telepathy. Uh, well, actually, let's not make it a complex belief because that just makes it more complicated. We could do telepathy works separately. Um, if that counts as knowledge, uh, so Nassim believes hypnotism works, let's say. Um, he's got to have the belief hypnotism works. Well, we know he has that. Uh, he presumably believes he's justified in believing hypnotism works. So second one's in. Um, but if it's going to be true, if, if Nassim knows that hypnotism works, then it's got to be the case that hypnotism works. Um, now, I completely accept that. I completely accept that. I would like to say, actually, we don't know that. But that's the thing. If it works sometimes, do we accept it as true? Well, yes, if it works sometimes, it works, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if hypnotism ever works, then hyp I mean, actually, sorry, uh, hypnotism probably does work, um, I'm told. Um, there have been some quite good experiments about this. Um, maybe we should try it with the other one. What was the other one? Telepathy. Um, in that case, we've got the situation I've got there. I, I think telepathy is less likely to work than hypnotism, but that's what I believe. Maybe I'm wrong. Sorry, I've got... Three, four. Sorry. Um, Externalists believe that, that mind is not in the head, if I, if I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily in the head. Do they make, not only in the head. Do they make any statement about where you might find it in the physical world other than in the head? No, they don't think it's located. So physical states are located. This pen is located in space-time. 
okay, um, to describe the location, you'd have to, to relate it to me and to John and to everything else, etc. Um, this, anything physical must be located in space-time. The mind, we thought before, when we were internalists, is located inside the head. If you're an externalist, you believe there is stuff located inside the head without which mental s there wouldn't be any mental states. But mental states themselves are not located in space at all. I think I struggled with that. <laughs> Uh, that's because you model mental states on physical states. As long as you model mental states on physical states, given that physical states have to be located in space, you will think that mental states have to be located in space. But if you scrap your model of physical states, sorry, mental states as physical states, you'll see that my belief, if it isn't located inside my head, perhaps isn't located anywhere. Instead, it spreads over the world. So my belief that John is wearing a grey coat is at the moment a belief that's a function of a, of a relation that's um, there's six foot between me and John. But when John goes home and I go home, there's going to be a lot more than that. Um, so the belief sort of... A bit like Dawkins memes, are they? Really? No. no. Could could one not compare them a little bit? Certainly not. <laughs> no. I, I do. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go on. Uh, could Colin McGinn possibly have been right in no. suggesting? <laughs> that in suggesting that we shall never crack the mind-body problem because our brains haven't got the capacity to do it, or is Tom Schnabel a better bet in suggesting that give us 50 years and we shall crack it? Yeah. Depends what you mean by crack it, doesn't it? Well, um, understand. The I mean, if, if Colin McGinn is saying that physics will never understand the mind, and Nagel is saying physics will understand the mind, that's one way of understanding that. If Colin is saying we will never understand the mind, in other words, leaving it open that perhaps we understand it, but not it as a physical theory, and Nagel is saying. Um, we will understand the mind, though not necessarily as a physical theory. Do you see that the distinction becomes too different? Um, I mean, I, I, I can tell you where I stand on that one. I think we will understand the mind, but that we won't understand it as a physical state. Um, so I, I'm, well, depending on which way you understand them, I'm with either of them. Even Colin. Another question. The question is from here. Yeah, um, Penny, it's, it's the case, I think, that there are some instances where somebody can control the movement of an artificial limb just by thinking about it. Yes, um, yeah, really interesting so, stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, doesn't that have something to say about whether physics is causally closed or, or whether mental states can... Okay. Well, no, because we don't know what a mental state is. <laughs> we, that's what we're asking. Yeah. When I mean, in that case, yeah. it's just that if it really the is... signals in the brain, they're actually feeding the computer and make the limb work. Yeah. yeah, but as an externalist, we know that there's something in the brain, and presumably in this case, this something in the brain is, is having an impact on the... Um, and we know that nothing I do, I would be able to do if I didn't have a working brain. Um, but that doesn't mean that the bits of the brain that are working my behaviour are thoughts. I mean, if the epidemiologist is right, maybe they're not. Um, but if I'm thinking, I want that leg to move, is that not a thought? That's a thought, but it, whether that thought causes your leg to move is, is a question that we might... I mean, I know you think it does. But, but that's what we've been looking at, haven't we? So if you're an identity theorist, you would say, of course, the mental state that's causing the limb to move is a mental state, therefore the mental state is causing the limb to move. If you're an epiphenomenalist, you think the, there's a mental, uh, sorry, a physical state that is both causing you to think that you're moving the limb and is moving the limb, but your thought is not moving the limb. Do you see what I mean? So, so I can answer that question in any way I like, depending on what my theory of mind is. Um, and, and people assume that it's the thought that's moving the limb, but that's because they don't know anything about these theories. Maybe, or if they do, they're ignoring them. 
Uh, two more questions, because I'm enjoying myself. Might we call a collection of mental states a culture, if we don't like memes? Um, I think that's a more... I don't like memes, and I do prefer culture. Yeah, I mean, actually, I do think there's something quite interesting. If, if we say that um, our thoughts aren't located inside our head, um, that would make sense of the fact that we share thoughts. Um, so when we communicate, we actually we think the same thought. Now, obviously, there's different things going on in my head to your head, as you're having what's going on in your head, and I've got what's going on in my head. But the thought that we have is the very same thought. And we do actually talk like that, don't we? And if we both have the very same thought, then that thought isn't located either in your head or in mine. Um, but that, so that would be assuming that thoughts are... We share the same token thought, not just the same type thought. Are you with me? Um, but, but actually, when you take externalism on board, it makes sense of a lot of the way that we talk about thoughts. Um, and a lot of these thoughts, if we share the same thought in a culture, a community shares a picture of the world, maybe that's what a culture is. Maybe that's what a community is. Elena? So, Last one. <laughs> yeah. so the prevailing ideas right now are externalism. Uh, whether they're prevailing, I have said nothing about that. No, no, what, what I'm asking is, what, where do you think we're going now? What is the most critical question now asked by philosophers? Or what is the mind? <laughs> yeah. that, that's still the question. Do they ever define <coughs> what it is that I mean? <laughs> Every single one of the theories I've been through this weekend is an attempt to answer that question. None of them have worked very well. But in the same way, when we say, is the theory of general relativity correct, or is string theory correct, they can't both be correct because they do have different consequences. Um, well, it doesn't look as if they can both be correct because on the theory of general relativity, neutrinos cannot travel faster than light, on string theory, I understand they can, says so she, sounding as if she knows something about physics, which she doesn't. You think it's impressive. Thank you. Huh? OK, we're going to stop there. Um, thank you. We're going to the bar, so thank you.